first I want to talk about how I struggle with true crime podcasts. <laughs> Would you confess with me? Anybody in the room struggle with, I know there's more than that. It's okay. Like, I'm on stage confessing. I travel a lot for my job, and so I start out really holy. It's like worship music, listening to the Bible, uh, sermons, praise God, and then and then it's just theft and death and how they got away. <laughs> like, it's disturbing. It just happens. It's, it's immediate. I just, I have a bathroom break. I get back in the car, and it's death. And uh, I don't know what happens there. But I was listening to this one, uh, one it, was a, it was a podcast, it's first season, called Good Assassins. And don't judge me yet. Don't, don't judge me yet, okay? You're like, how could that be? A Good Assassins is about this Israeli spy who takes down one of the most notorious villains of the Holocaust, okay? So you were judging me first. You're like, how could he do that? He's a pastor. Now you're like, where do I find it? Where, 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 is it Apple? Is it Spotify? So, so that's what it's, it's about a, a, a spy codenamed Mio. He's got a codename, which is amazing, who slipped into over 120 different identities, so not only did he take down the butcher of the, hol- of the Holocaust, but he slipped into over 120 different identities over the course of his career. He's, he's known as one of the most effective spies in espionage that has ever lived. The plan. Do, do you know what his superpower was? Do you know how this, this guy could slip in and out of, in and out of identities and, and not be known? His superpower was that he was ordinary. Ordinary was his superpower. He was a short, stocky, whitish, bald man. And if I just described you, I'm really sorry. If you're just, <laughs> if you're like, hold up, does that mean I'm ordinary? I just, you'll be fine. <laughs> just live off the other encouragements that happened today. <laughs> Your wife's like, it's okay. It's <laughs> that's, that's what his superpower was. Because he was short, stocky, whitish, and a bald man, he could slip into any place at any time in any different identity, and no one knew or cared. So ordinary was his superpower. Now, hold on to that for a second. Tight, bald fist, I'm going to give you some really bad news. Uh, American Christianity is in a tragic crisis. Right now, American Christianity is in a crisis. We're dying a casual and comfortable death. It's, it's almost like we're sitting in a foxhole, and there's a war raging on over our heads, and we're in that foxhole checking Twitter or threads, whatever we're supposed to be checking at this point, and, and we don't have a plan to get out. And we don't even know the crisis that we sit in. And I think, because I, I, I try to at least pray about these things and identify these things, I think the main problem is that we are not paying attention to God's design for the church. He had a plan for the church, a design for the church. He architected the church. He laid out his blueprints. And we said, yeah, we're good. We'll figure it out from here. So we think that God designed the church for the extraordinary, for the extraordinarily gifted, mostly those people who stand on stage and are orders and can speak and can proclaim or people who can hit the right note. And and I'm, you know, this is my job. I speak in front of you. So I'm not speaking down against those people. Uh, But what I am saying is we think that God designed the church for those people, the extraordinary or the extraordinarily holy, whatever that means. And I don't even think we can define that. But we just know that we have a standard for those extraordinarily gifted people that speak and sing and hit the right note. And we also think there's supposed to be this extra level of holy with a little extra holy sauce on top of it. And then when they fall off that holy cliff that we ourselves put them on, we're shocked. We're surprised. And then we go, woe is me, how, how, how is Christianity going this way? How could God do this? And we put this on God. He's like, I never designed it for them. I never designed it to pick the extraordinary and give them an ordinary calling. I designed it to pick the ordinary and give them an extraordinary calling. So his plan was to find the ordinary all along, fill them with his extraordinary spirit. We're all filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and then give us an extraordinary calling. That's what we're going to talk about today, that extraordinary calling, but you can go back to Abram, to Jacob, to Isaac, to Noah, to Moses, to Joshua, to David, to most of the judges, to most of the prophets, to how God picks where Jesus will be born, the family that he'll be born into, and the disciples that he picks to change the world. This has always been his plan. It's to find the ordinary. The truth is the ordinary is God's jam. He's proven it. Picking the ordinary is how he rolls, and more importantly, it's how he designed the church. So I want to call you out today. I want to give you a calling. I decided to become a pastor in a room just like this. I decided to follow Jesus in a room just like this. So I want to give you a calling in a room just like this and ask you to pay attention to that calling and ask you to pay attention to the architect. Here's how he designed the church, and here's who he calls you, and I'll prove this from the text today. We're going to be in 1 Peter 1 and 2, if you care about it, if you want to turn there, I'll come back to it. It'll be on the screen all the time, so you don't have to worry too much about it, but you're welcome to turn there if you're one of those folks. I love it. But here's what I want to prove from the text, and this is important. You are God's choice. You are God's church. And you are God's priest. That last one might trip you up a little bit, but just stick with me. And I'll say this with the negative in tow, because sometimes that helps. You are God's choice. It is not the special. It's not the extraordinarily gifted. It's not those who went to Bible school. It's not the men or women of the cloth. They're part of God's choice. But you are God's choice. You are God's church. And some of us know this. If you've been in the church for... 20 minutes, you've heard this saying, the church is not a building, it's a people. It's a people, right? We know this. We can can regurgitate this if we've been in the church for a little while. But we're 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 not acting like it, right? We're not acting like we are God's church. We're not acting like the ordinary, the people of God, the chosen people are the fabric in the building blocks of the church. We still think the church is a building that we go to. It's religious events. It's things that we do. It's not who we are. So you are God's choice. You are God's church. church. Last one, you are God's priest. I know you're thinking, man, this dude is crazy. I'm not crazy. Ask my mom. (laughs) Remember back in the day? Worked every time. You're like, ask my mom. They're like, oh, shoot, my bad. No, I'm not going to do that. That's okay. I believe you. I didn't mean to summon the likes of your mom. (laughs) I'll prove to you what I'm talking about uh, through the text. Really, God is proving this to you. Really, there needs to be an identity shift, okay? Or the church will continue to die. We'll continue to just build big buildings in the suburbs. People will come to them and consume and go home and things will be pretty much the same. If there's not some sort of identity shift. It's kind of like, I am not a suit wearer. I'll put on a suit. If I have to for my job, for a wedding, for a funeral, for a thing, and sometimes I need to put on a suit. But I am not a suit wearer. Because as soon as it hits 1 p.m. and the thing is over, your boy is in sweatpants. I mean, I can't get in sweatpants faster because I hate wearing suits. Because my identity is not that I'm a suit wearer. It's that I'll put on the suit. And, and my point is that for centuries, we have put on these suits. Okay, yeah, we're the church. Okay, yeah, we're chosen. Okay, yeah, the church is not a building. It's a be- Okay, yeah, we're the priesthood of all believers, the Bible says. Okay, but we haven't had an identity shift. We're just wearing the suit from time to time. We're not suit wearers. So my, my point is that we need an identity shift. It needs to go all the way, and we need to have a full 360. We need to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, all of our heart, all of our mind, Um, Let me just give this example. Like, uh, we know that the church is not a building, it's a people. However, COVID hits, there's no more buildings. We can't go there. And 30% of the people leave the church. And they never come back. Because the church was not a people to them. It was a building. 
So we knew it in our minds, but there was no identity shift, okay? So I'm convinced if we would step into, if, if God's ordinary, all of us, would step into the extraordinary calling that we have, I am convinced that we would change the world. I'm not speaking in lofty rhetoric or hyperbole. I'm not just trying to get you hyped up. I'm trying to say, this is God's original design. So if we would just be obedient, his plan is to change the world. If we will be disobedient, we won't change the world. Let's talk about 1 Peter before we read it. Let's talk about the people of 1 Peter. Look, whenever you're reading the Bible, I'll just give you a quick couple notes here. Whenever you're reading the Bible, the messenger matters, okay? Wh who's writing matters, and who are they writing to? That gives you the context. The Bible is 66 books. It's written over thousands of years. There's lots of authors. There's lots of context. You don't want to get confused. All you got to do is simply figure out who, who is the person writing to and who's actually writing it. So let's talk about the who of First Peter. The who of First Peter is there's a guy writing it down. His name is Sylvanus. He's not that important. He's just Peter's friend. Peter is the important person giving all the, all the words and the ideas. Okay, Peter is one of Jesus' inner circle. So Jesus had 12 disciples. It just means follower or pupil or, or student of Jesus. He had 12 of those, and he had three inner circle. And Peter is one of those inner circle peop people. Uh, by the way, I just sometimes we say Peter and people quick. I was doing devotions with my kids one night. I said peeper, uh, and they have, <laughs> they, have never let they have never let me down. They're like, okay, peeper. I'm like, relax. We're trying to pray, okay? So, Peter is one of the original three, all right? And who he's writing to is super important. He's writing to some Jews, yes, but mostly he's writing to the Gentiles. The Gentiles. Now, Gentile is an identity. It means nation. But more importantly in this context, it means nation who's not somebody else. You ever been an identity that... Was, it, was, it was so degrading, it was just that you weren't somebody else. That's who the Gentiles are. They're not Jews. That's how degrading this is. You know, I kind of think of that Aladdin moment where he's like, infidel. Like that's where 11 times in the Bible when it says Gentile, it just means heathen. Right? Th these people, just picture this. You can picture this today with me if you want to. Uh, they're going to the temple. They have to go into a different door. To worship God. They have to go in through a different door. That'd be like us telling some group of people, I want you to go through a different door if you really want to worship God with us. That's who the Gentiles are. It's, it's an identity. These, these people are uh, wandering around Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and Peter's writing to them. They don't know who they are. They don't know what their identity is. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing for God. They don't know what God wants from them, and their identity is built entirely off of who they are not. So the Old Testament is God's people are the Jewish people. They're the Israelites. He rescues them. He calls them his own. Uh, they are his children. He is their father. He makes promises to them, but it was always pointing to the Messiah, who is Jesus, who now says he loves everybody. I want everybody to be grafted into my family. So Jesus lives for these people, dies for everyone. He resurrects for everyone. He calls everyone chosen, and now everything changes for everyone, but these people are still holding on to it. It's like, it's like being a plus one at a wedding. Like you're invited, but you're not really invited. <laughs> you were invited, but you weren't chosen. So when the bride and groom come around, they're like, who are you and why are you eating my steak? Like what's, what happened here? That's the Gentiles, right? They're, they're the plus ones at the wedding and they're going through different doors and I mean, even, even Peter, the, the writer of this letter before he matures in Christ, uh, he gets called under the rug because they're at the lunch table and he's just hanging out with the Jews. He's like a mean girl. <laughs> he's just hanging out with the Jews. And so Paul calls him up. He's like, hey, not calls him on a phone. They didn't have no, but you know what I'm saying? He calls him over. He said, you, can, you can't just eat with the, you eat with the Gentiles because Christ spent a lot of his time with the Gentiles. He died for the Gentiles. So this is who the Gentiles are. This is our audience. 
In other words, they're the ordinary, the nobodies. They're the extraordinary without the extra. <laughs> and they're being persecuted, by the way. Just to, just to add on to this, by their Roman neighbors and other Jews, they're being persecuted. All right, we got our, our audience here? Namely, what I want you to know is they don't know who they are. And so Peter writes this letter, it's a letter, to tell them who they are. And I think we need to have a Peter moment where we need to discover who we are. All right? Here we go. Took me a long time to get in there. Sorry about that. <clears throat> As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Let me say it again. As you come to him, him is Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious and precious. Uh, all he's saying here is you are just like Jesus. Here's how you're rejected by men. Speaking of Gentiles, remember, you're rejected by men just like Jesus was, and on top of that, you're chosen and you're precious. Remember, I have to remind you, he's not talking about the educated. He's not talking about those who have these flashy gifts. He's not talking about the microphone superstars. He's not talking about any of those people. He's talking to the ordinary wanderers who don't know who they are. He says, you're chosen. And he starts off the letter this way. Like if we go back to the very first sentence, like think about it. On Monday morning, you're gonna, if you work at any job, you're going to send an email. That's what happens on Monday mornings. I'm going to do it. And the first thing I'm going to think about is, what do I call this person? And I'll erase it four times, right? Or these people, gentlemen, no, it's too formal. Bro, no, unformal. I, I was just, you just work through it because you're trying to figure out, what do I call this person? Let me show you how he introduces the letter to those chosen. That's how he starts off, comma, to those chosen. In these places, in uh, modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor, I, I want you to know that you're chosen. I want you to have an identity shift. Why? Well, they're not going to change the world if they first don't understand how Christ is changing their world. We're not going to be a movement of God if we first don't understand the movement of God happening inside of us as individuals. We spend all of our time just, oh, the American church this, that church this, this church that. You're, you're talking to the wrong person. Like you could easily be like, Justin, I hate that shirt. Okay, great. And you could check my tag, like who's, who's the shirt? You could, you could be mad at me, you could be mad at who makes the shirt, or you could figure out the origin. Like who designed the shirt? That's who we need to get to. Do you know who the fabric of the church is? It's you and me. So if you don't understand what God is doing in your heart, don't expect him to change the world. It starts here. So he speaks to these people and he says, you are chosen. You are God's choice. And I need that to sink in for some of you. Like some of you have abandonment things going on in your life. So like, like people have abandoned you. You have abandonment wounds deep down in your soul. And you still haven't got over it yet. And so it's hard for you to be chosen. Some of you have never been chosen. Like it started out with dodgeball. <laughs> you know, you just weren't that special at things or, and so you've never, no one's ever looked at you like we just did with these volunteers and said, I see you, I choose you, I know you, I choose you in spite of you. No one's ever said that to you. So it's hard for you to make this shift that the God of the universe is arranged, and the same God who arranged the stars is arranging this moment to say, I pick you. You're my choice. Yes, you. It's not a flippant choice. It's not like dodgeball or going through the McDonald's drive through It's from the foundations of the world. This is uh, the second verse in 1 Peter 1. According to the foreknowledge, what Sammy talked about this morning, God knew uh, the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. In other words, it was the Father's plan, the Spirit carried it out, that you would be God's chosen and precious one. 
Again, messenger matters. Peter, I don't know if you know this, he wasn't actually named Peter. That's not his name. His name is Simon, okay? Simon was a fisherman who didn't quite cut it in school. So he didn't really make it through what the equivalent of, uh, of our schooling would be like middle school. He didn't get chosen to follow a certain rabbi. Uh, he didn't get chosen in Jewish school. So he's a fisherman. And if you hold up, you know, a picture of the ancient Jewish dictionary, uh, you know, for the word ordinary, there's Simon. Like, it's a big fish. You know, it's, it's who he is, right? That's who he is. And then an extraordinary rabbi walks by his boat one day and looks at him in the eyes and says, I choose you. That's hard for him to get. But he says, I choose you. And so he follows this rabbi. That rabbi's Jesus. And Jesus lives for him and dies for him. And then he, he talks to Jesus in resurrected form. And that'll just do something to you, right? And somewhere along the way, Matthew 16, Jesus goes, who do you guys think I am? And Peter goes, you're him. You know what the kids are saying these days? He's him. Peter said, you're him. You're the Messiah. And so Jesus gives him a nickname. What's the nickname? Peter, called the Rock, all right? Which is before Dwayne Johnson. This dude was the Rock. <laughs> for real, for real, okay? This dude's the Rock. It's a great nickname. Now, here's the, here's the crazy part. No one even remembers his old name. No one even remembers. Like, if, if it wasn't documented and I didn't tell you, I'd be like, what was Peter's name? You'd be like, I don't know. You try Googling it. Chat GBT or whatever. You'd just be like, well, how do I find this? No one knows his old name. In other words, who he is now has eclipsed who he once was. So who he is now, someone who is chosen, someone who is picked by the rabbi, by the rabbi, by the Messiah, has eclipsed this person who was under the dictionary as the word ordinary. Uh, back in college, <clears throat> I was a freshman, and I got a nickname, Juice. And it's a good nickname. Juice is a good nickname. It could, it could be a lot worse, y'all, okay, as a freshman. So the problem is people always ask. It's one of those nicknames people always ask, how would you get that nickname? And the story stinks. So that's the problem with the nickname. Because, like, the story goes, uh, I'm a freshman. I played college soccer. We're on a bus. We're going somewhere far away. And a senior is like, let me get some juice. I'm from New York, y'all. We don't, we don't share juice. You're not, you're not over here lipping my juice. You know what I mean? Like, if it's my juice, I earned it. It's my juice. You know, it's like, get your own juice. So that's what I said. I said, get your own juice. He's like, what do you mean? And now three or four people are on the bus, like, looking at me. What do you, what you mean, get your own juice? I'm like, I'm not from the Midwest. I don't share juice, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> for me, this was it. I, this was like, this was gospel for me. So I'm just telling him, like, this is my juice. Like, get off me. So I'm, I'm, I'm all hot about it. Hence the nickname, Juice, you know? <laughs> the story's so stupid, you know, like... Why'd you get the name Juice? It's because you're big muscles? No, it's because I didn't give someone juice. You know, it's like <laughs> stupid. But here's the thing, like, if you ask someone from that college what was his name, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know the name Justin. Like, the, at some point, the name that you're given eclipses your old identity. And that's what has to happen here. Like your new identity as the chosen one, as someone who is chosen, as a choice made by God, has to eclipse your old identity of, I'm just someone who's kind of ordinary and is going to sit in the back and maybe just take in some of the church. Like God is choosing you to be a part of the church. He's choosing you to be his missionary, his priest, his chosen one. Let's unpack some of those. First, though, you are God's choice. Back to our main scripture. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. You yourselves, like living stones are being built up 
as a spiritual house. Now, here's what God wants you to picture. One, that you're chosen, and two, that you are the fabric of the church. You're the makeup of the church. Not a building, not a place, not an event, not a program, not where there are religious people that are going to conduct a religious service over you. No, you are the fabric. So he wants you to close your eyes. Maybe you, you don't have to close your eyes with me. But you, if you can picture it with your eyes open, that's fine too. He wants you to picture this, a temple, a spiritual house, a spiritual building, all right? And I'm no architect. Matter of fact, most things that I build are crooked. Uh, most things that I hang up are crooked. Or they're missing a leg or I assemble something and there's like 15 screws left over and I'm like, what the heck? Where do these screws go? Maybe you're like that, okay? That's me. So I'm no genius at this. But I do know ancient architecture, ancient building practices, is you find the best, most perfect stone and you lay it down first. It's called the cornerstone. It's called the capstone. And then every other stone after that is laid to that level. It's laid because of that. It's laid uh, basing everything off of that simple cornerstone. Now, Jesus is called the cornerstone 11 times throughout the scriptures and just three verses later from what we're talking about. He is the cornerstone. And what he's saying is, I'm going to build a new church off of me, off of my truth, off of my good news. And that new church, you are a living stone. So what once was, what once was is you go to a place to find the presence of God. You need to go there. You need to to be there. There needs to be some religious ceremony. And then you can find the presence of God. What used to be that is now you. You are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are now filled with the presence of God. And wherever you go, it goes. Wherever church happens is because you are there. We all need a building. We don't need a place. We don't need a person. We just need you, the living stone. I mean, we've been lied to, and it, a lot of it hasn't been that we, we meant to lie to our kids, but it starts out when you're a kid, right? Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open it up, and here are the people. Right? I don't even know how it goes, but it's like, oh my gosh. As a kid, you're like, there they are. <laughs> right? It should be, here is a church. We don't need no steeple. The church ain't a building. The church is a people. <laughs> Bars. <you know? laughs> but it, that's, that's our study of the church. It starts early, doesn't it? And we start to understand that if I want to have church, if I want to speak the gospel, hear the gospel, hear the good news. If I want to hear the Bible or teach the Bible or be a part of the Bible or be a part of the presence of God, I need to go somewhere. Jesus is saying, I'm building a new church. I'm doing a new thing. You're it. You're a breathing stone of the church. So you are God's choice. You are God's church. Uh, Last one, you are God's priest. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That word holy means set apart. Set apart. I I set you aside to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Last one again, you are God's priest. Now, um, I teach on the priesthood a lot. And it, I could just see it. I could just feel it on the people. There are lots of reasons why people aren't going to accept this idea that they are a priest. And I, I like, f- first of all, one of the one of the reactions that I, is that, like, s- sometimes I'll be like, tell a neighbor you're a priest, and I could just tell it never works, because they say it, and there's like a physical matrix dodging. You know, like when someone's calling you something, you're like, who? Not me. There's like a physical, no, no, I don't want to be a priest. And we'll talk about those reasons in a second, 
But the one, there's a, usually like a physical dodging of the idea that you are a priest. Number two, you like it, you'll put on the suit, it's a good idea, but it's kind of ethereal, atmospheric. It's never really going to touch down. You're never going to really go, I'm, I'm going to identify as, as a priest or as a pastor for using modern day language. I'm not really going to identify as that. Uh, Martin Luther is an important person. Uh, he started the Protestant Reformation, which you can Google later. We don't have time to break that down right now. But he, said, he says this, this word priest should be as common as the word Christian. Right? Now, now here are why those responses happen, those kind of physically dodging, ethereal responses. One, we've eternally attached the, the idea of priest to those men or women of the cloth. And first, I mean, the first thing I thought when I heard about a priest is like, I want to get married, y'all, so I ain't even trying to play with that. Right? Okay, first, first thought. If you're just being, I'm like, I can't, I can't. Mm -mm. So I got too many thoughts. I need to get married. So, all right. First thing you think is, I don't know why I went there. Uh, it wasn't on the thing, so... But honestly, they're, they're, it's an unappealing lifestyle, number one. Uh, number two, you might have actual woundings from, from the idea of priest or from the idea of organized religion in that sense. Uh, number two, it's that we've attached the idea of vocational to the idea of functional. Okay, so the Bible talks about both. Yeah, there's vocational, but there's also functional. So think about the term missionary. In the Bible, there are vocational missionaries, right? Peter's one of them. He gets paid to travel the world and speak the name of Jesus and start churches, etc. It's his vocation. It's his job. But there are functionary, functional missionaries. God tells us that we should all be on mission. We should all be heralds or speakers of the gospel. Storytellers is your language. We should all be that. We don't just need them in Africa. We need them here. So we can't just go hiring everybody to talk about Jesus. That makes no logistical sense. We need functional and vocational. And we, we've attached those things for, for centuries. But God wants us all to be functional priests. Every single one of us. Uh, now I need to make that really simple because, again, it, it's complicated. Uh, all of us are, it's still ethereal for us, it's atmospheric. I want to bring it down to the most practical level I can and then just talk about you and that's how we'll end. Here we go. Here's what a priest is. You are called to be a carrier. You're a carrier of the blessings and presence of God. So let me just break that down. You are a carrier of the blessings. Think about some of the blessings. The mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, the love of God. That's what you are. You hold on to that. You know it. You feel it. It's been a part of your life. God picked you up. He turned you around. He set your feet on solid ground. And that's how you know. So that love of God lives inside of you. And you're not supposed to keep it for yourself. How selfish would we be if we're like, God, transform my life. Thank you keeping it for myself. My juice. <laughs> huh? But many of us do that because we think that it's other people's job to be the carriers of that blessing. It's vocational. No, no, no. You are called to be a carrier of those blessings. You are called to be a presence. Remember, you, can, you are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians, Ephesians, you're called to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, to dance with the Holy Spirit, to make sure you know where the Holy Spirit's going, how he's filling you, and what to do about it. That's you. You're chosen to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be the presence of God to the people around you. Now, here are the three categories I want to put these in, okay? You're called to be a carrier of the blessings and the presence to your people, places, and platforms. All right, is that memorable? Y'all love language around here, okay? Y'all love to have crazy good names for everything, okay? So here's, I'm hoping this, this is not going to be Soma City level, okay? 
I'm just trying to be with you on your level. But here it is. You're called to be a priest to your people, your places, and your platform. Okay? So your people, you know those people. I don't even need to say their names. I don't need to ask you about them for 20 minutes. You could write them down right now. There are people who need the love of God in your life, and they're in your life. You can think of them. And they're broken, they're brokenhearted, they're lost, they're anxious. Sometimes they're not, but you just know because of their proximity to you, you're supposed to be their priest. And if you spend all your time trying to bring them to Sammy, Sammy's going to move to San Diego. (laughs) He ain't got time. It doesn't make any logistical sense. This is why God did this. It doesn't make logistics. It doesn't make, I don't, is logistical a word? Yes, okay. Super smart. Uh, it doesn't make logistical sense to bring everybody to a place. It does make sense to make you a living stone, breathing the presence of God, the blessings of God to those people. Who are they? Write them down. And here's the best place to start. Another P. Pray. Pray for them. Y'all, I'll be in a conversation with someone on the plane, I'll just go, God, will you give me a moment to talk to them about you? Most of the time he does. Just pray. God, how do I bring this, how do I bring you to this person? That's where you start. Okay, your people, your place. Where is your place? I always say this, because I, I had this moment back in the day. My wife came from, home from work. She, she works in the NICU, and she, wa- you know, she wasn't breaking HIPAA or anything like that, but she was just breaking down some of the moments that she had with people throughout the day. She didn't say people's names or nothing like that, but she's saying, I got to love these people. I got to pray for these people. I got to be around these people. And all I could think is, you are a better priest than me, because I sit in an office, and I craft a talk, and people are going to judge that at Bob Evans on the way home. Like, that's what, that's just not as powerful as people are in the infant ICU meeting a person who has the presence and blessings of God. Not as powerful. So where's your place? If it's not a job, is it a playground? Is it a kid's sport? Like, my place is soccer. I'm with those people all year round. Huh? I'm tired of them people. Again, because I'm an introvert. But God, those are the people God gave me. That's the place. Soccer. We're, we're with each other constantly. They're yelling at their kids, and I'm like, okay, they definitely need Jesus. All right? You know what I mean? People. Place. Write down two places. Neighborhood. Job. Uh, last one. Platform. Platform is just another word for, and it's because I needed a P. It's just another word <laughs> For influence, God has given us all a level of influence. So where is that level of influence? Like I always think about this. What if Beyonce loved Jesus? I mean, because she's been given giftings that if she gave back to Jesus on that platform, that'd be, that'd be something else. Like, what's your, you're probably not Beyonce. <laughs> uh, but what, you know, what, what, where's your level of influence? How can you use that influence uh, to serve Jesus, to be a priest? Y'all, I know this isn't the greatest or, or most attractive message that you're a priest. But like I said, if we would all just buy into that we're chosen, that we're God's choice, that we're God's church on the move, that we are his priests spreading out like a virus, I just think everything would change. So that's my plea to you this morning. Would you take that seriously? Would you take that into your soul? Would you write some things down? Would you write the people down? Would you write the places down? Would you write the platform down? And would you just ask God, how are you gonna use me? You don't have to bring these people back to the church. You are the church. You can. At some point, if you're like, ah, I just need them to have a more robust community, great, bring them here. Here we go. But but you're the first line of defense. Like, God wants to call you. Let's pray.
God, I just think about this moment um, where I sat, again, in a room just like this, and I, I couldn't believe the God of the universe would call me out and speak directly to my guts <laughs> and say, I choose you, I want you to do A, B, or C. I, I couldn't believe that you would do that. Now I believe that you do it all the time. And so I'm asking you to do that in this room. Because something happens when the people of God get together. Something happens when the people of God get together. So would you do that in this room? People who thought that they had no part in this, would you tell them they got a part? People who thought that they were never chosen, would you tell them that they're chosen? People who thought that, you know, they, they, there, there was no plan for them. There was no radical calling. There was no extraordinary calling. Would you tell the ordinary this morning, they are called to your extraordinary mission of being a priest to their people, their places, and their platforms. <laughs> and we'll just sit in your presence. We'll worship you in that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.